slimy slug is invading your base. A slimy slug has entered my base. Rock Raiders was the very first RTS game I ever played, and it began in me a lifelong love of the genre. I had read about this game in Lego Mania magazine, and I already owned a few Rock Raider Lego sets. After asking for a very, very long time, I received Rock Raiders the PC game for Christmas in 2001. Now, I know what you're thinking. William, don't you normally cover video games related to tabletop properties on this channel? And why yes, that's true. But are you going to argue with me that Lego isn't a tabletop property? Uh, but in all seriousness, that Undermountain video was really tough to make, and I just, I kinda just needed something fun before I dove into Heroes of the Lance next week. So here we are, and let me tell you, this game has been very gentle with me. You know, it's been very kind. The narration talks to you like you're a child, but not in the pretentious way, more in a listen up space cadets kind of way. Hello Rock Raider cadet, and welcome to the Rock Raider Academy. As this is your first day of training, we will start with the basics. Now before we get into the game proper, we gotta talk about Rock Raiders in general because much like Bionicle, it was a sort of multimedia affair. Rock Raiders are the mining crew of the LMS Explorer, who travel the galaxy in search of, well... Start our mining operation by collecting five energy crystals. Once this has been done, continue with the mining operation and collect five more energy crystals. And collect 15 energy crystals. You'll need all of it if you are to collect the 50 energy crystals that we still need. Listen up, Rock Raiders, cause this is a tricky one. You'll need to blast through the rock down below, and then hit the like button, and then collect 35 energy crystals. You see, in most versions of the Rock Raider story, the LMS Explorer gets terribly damaged and then sucked into a wormhole to the planet U in a distant galaxy. In order to return home, the Rock Raiders will need to acquire a vast fortune in energy crystals to make repairs and fuel their tanks. And I say most versions, because like I said, this was intended as a multimedia franchise, albeit it was one that never took off the way that properties like Bionicle or Ninjago did. There were games, and yes, games plural, not singular, but there were also physical sets comic books, and a short novel. Now, I actually didn't go out and seek any of that spin-off stuff off for this review, because it just, I don't know, it just didn't seem relevant for my review of the PC game. Is what I would say if I was a hack. Now, I ended up reading all this stuff and realized that there's not actually a ton to talk about when it comes to all this spin-off material. So I'm just gonna kind of loop back to all this stuff whenever it becomes relevant in the video. For now, just let it be known that the comic book, High Adventure Deep Underground, was written by Alan Grant for some reason, which I am personally choosing to interpret means that Rock Raiders is actually a Judge Dredd spin-off. But more important than all of that is to know that Rock Raiders is, I mean, it's a little bit like Batman in that the origin story is told in virtually every single rendition, but it's always a little bit different each time. Now, that's basically everything you need to know about the Rock Raiders line before we jump into the game, other than to take a second to differentiate the PC and PlayStation versions of Rock Raiders. Same title, same engine, came out the same year, but they are entirely different games. The PS4 version was like an adventure game in which you play as a single Rock Raider, whereas the PC game, on the other hand, was an RTS, and that's what I'm reviewing today. And while it's true that there are only two officially made Rock Raiders games, Games, there also happens to be a 2021 fan remake of the Rock Raiders PC game. It's called Manic Miners, and we're gonna touch on it a little bit as this review goes on. The game starts with a fairly long cutscene. I'll show you some of it, but I'm not willing to splice the entire five minute long cutscene into my video.
Welcome to Planet U. From here, we have 25 levels as we tunnel deeper to the horde of energy crystals at the core of the planet. Rock hard! The missions in Rock Raiders are presented in a bunch of different forms. From gauntlet missions where you have to drill until you find your way to safety, to missions where you have to rush to find resources before lava flows submerge all available dig sites. This does help to create some variety in the missions, but in the end, almost all of them are chiefly concerned with the same goal. That's right folks, Rock Raiders literally only want one thing and it's brickin' disgusting. An energy crystal has been found. Yes! Hell yeah! Hey, come on, baby! Come on! Yes! An energy crystal has been found. An energy crystal has been found. Come on! Yes! Come on! Let's talk about the core gameplay because it's something of an oddball when it comes to RTS games. There's not a lot out there that's like it. If we have to compare it to stuff that's well known in the modern consciousness, Rock Raiders is probably a lot closer to Banished than it is to StarCraft. But that's a terrible comparison, made worse by the fact that no one was forcing me to make it. The better comparison is to a different classic game that came out that exact same year. You could pretty accurately call Rock Raiders a Dungeon Keeper 2-like, but that's not to say that Rock Raiders is a Dungeon Keeper ripoff. These games are a lot more like cousins than they are twins. Certainly, it seems like there are a few things that are undeniably influenced by Dungeon Keeper, especially a few quirks that seem to be like unsupported by the rest of the game. I would posit that these were somewhat clumsily stitched in after the devs saw them in Dungeon Keeper 2. The controls are fairly dated by our standards, as you'd probably expect. For example, you can't scroll across the map any other way than dragging your mouse to the edges of the screen. But it's not all bad. Like I said, Rock Raiders is a member of a subgenre of RTSs that never got enough titles to truly be called a subgenre. Sort of like player versus environment games that were pure classic RTS gameplay and not city builders. But you can see in Rock Raiders a few quality of life things that you might want out of this non-existent micro niche. For starters, it's nice that there are multiple ways to do the same command. You can click on a Rock Raider and manually have them knock down a wall, or you can click on the wall and have a Rock Raider auto assigned to drilling it. Likewise, if you require a raider to have specialist training to do a task that you've ordered to have done, one of your raiders will automatically go and get that training. You don't have to do it manually. You know, just small things that would have felt bad if they weren't in game. Though there are some things that were clearly done in the name of quality of life that feel extraneous or half implemented. Most likely these were mechanics that the devs saw in other games, coded into rock raiders, and then promptly ran out of time to properly integrate. There's a map tool that creates a flat version of the map. It's unwieldy as hell, but it is there. More impressively, you can actually take command of any Rock Raider you want from a first person perspective. You can't really do anything from that perspective other than just drilling walls, but it is something they implemented. Now this mechanic clearly comes from the Dungeon Keeper 2 possession system, but it's a significantly worse version of it. In Dungeon Keeper, this is an actual mechanic. You get a full suite of abilities that you can do in possession mode. Rock Raiders First Person, however, is pretty much only good for screenshots. See, this game did an amazing job at gathering assets and mechanics, but then they just completely biffed it when it came to assembling them together. It's quite frustrating, really, because I think it's clear that if the team had another six months, then Rock Raiders would have been remembered as one of the great landmark titles of the era. Enough about the controls, let's talk gameplay. You start almost every map with a tool store and the ability to teleport Rock Raiders into the cavern. The tool store is where your little orange boys can pick up picks, shovels, dynamite, and laser beams. It's also the site where you'll be dropping off all your resources. The Rock Raiders can only carry a certain number of tools, but they can each be upgraded to have additional inventory slots. 
They can also receive specialist training for jobs like driving and demolitions. The odd quirk of this is that your rock raiders retain their training across missions, which should be nice because it should make it feel like you've got a specific team rather than a bunch of generic orange Lego men except it still feels like you've got a bunch of generic orange Lego men. See, the implementation feels like a bit of an empty mechanic. You have these units that can level up and gain specialist training, and that carries across your whole campaign, but I mean, they all look identical. And it's not like you can name them or anything, it's actually very difficult to tell them apart. Uh, I actually just discovered I was wrong here. Apparently you can rename Rock Raiders. That said, you don't see their name when they're running around, you only see it when you have selected them, so it really only solves half the problem. It feels like the continuation of these characters across the campaign should have added some interesting depth, but it kind of just it, it just kind of didn't add anything at all. This is one of the places where I think Rock Raiders is clearly influenced by Dungeon Keeper 2 in kind of a messy way. I think they wanted to improve on Dungeon Keeper's minion level ups by making them carry across the campaign. Unfortunately, no additional design was added in support of this increased importance of individual units. Regardless, the core tasks your Raiders will be doing outside of specialist tasks or emergencies are like this. Task the first, drilling walls. There are four types of walls, dirt, loose stone, hard rock, and solid rock. The first two can be freely drilled through by your raiders, though loose stone will take longer than dirt. Solid rock is unbreakable. Hard rock, on the other hand, is the unique type of stone, because your rock raiders can't actually drill it by hand. They'll need a vehicle like the small cutter or any of the more advanced drilling vehicles, or your specialist rock raiders will need to blast through it with dynamite, but they are real bad at it. A new cavern has been discovered. Task the second, digging up rubble. In theory, there is only one type of rubble. In practice, there are two. Rubble that results from drilling down walls, and rubble that results from cave-ins. Whenever you knock down a wall, it will reveal a few pieces of ore, possibly some energy crystals, and it will create a rubble pile. These piles will majorly slow down your raiders and speed up monsters. Digging them up, however, will reveal even more ore that can be brought back to the base. The other type of rubble has all of the same movement properties, but it is created by cave-ins of flat walls. The rubble that gets left behind is devoid of any ore inside of it, but you'll probably want to dig it up anyway for a few reasons. The first is the movement speed, but the second is far more important keeping your task count low. I'll touch on why that's important in a bit. These rubble piles will keep appearing as flat walls repeatedly cave in and will damage your raiders if they're nearby. You'll want to reinforce flat walls ASAP, or else you'll be eternally digging up these piles as your rock raiders have rocks crash on them over and over. Task the third, picking up and carrying stuff back to base. This would hardly be worth mentioning if it didn't take forever, and it also kind of involves a surprising amount of strategy. See, the main difficulty in Rock Raiders is more a test of patience than anything else. Once you're stabilized, there's not a ton of ways you can lose on most missions. When I was a kid, I was never actually able to finish this game, and it wasn't because I kept losing on missions or even losing my patience, it was actually because I just wasn't any good at optimizing resource collection efficiently, and then I'd run into bedtime and I'd have to restart the mission the next day. Trying to complete longer missions in a timely manner, or beat the timer on missions where you're racing against the clock, will require that you know how to transport resources efficiently. Sometimes this is going to to mean placing a second tool store closer to your mining sites. Other times, it's going to mean spamming power paths to help your little dudes run faster. Or more often than not, it means building transport vehicles to race across the map collecting things so that your foot dudes can focus on jobs that they're much better at. Task the fourth and the final, construction. Not much to say here, other than that it involves picking up resources and then dropping them on the build site. These things glitch out a lot though, so you may need to delete and then rebuild a few times in order to get it to actually work. The capstone to these four main tasks is this. The actual programming in Rock Raiders, it's, it, it's bad. It's egregious, in fact. If you open up the code, I'm quite certain you'll find some form of Lovecraftian horror staring back at you. 
The game is good about letting your Rock Raiders automatically assign themselves to various tasks that need doing, and one of the biggest mechanics you'll be constantly interacting with is adjusting the job priorities to accomplish whatever needs doing. Unfortunately, the Rock Raiders don't seem to follow this priority list terribly faithfully. Some tasks just seem to be innately hard-coded to be weighted higher in terms of priority. The other problem is that even though you can assign Rock Raiders manually to tasks, they'll still follow the priority list instead of listening to you. You can tell a unit to go dig up some rubble, but in the end, he's just going to ignore you because there's an energy crystal on the other side of the map that he thinks he's supposed to pick up instead. And that's when everything's working right. If you have too many tasks available for your Rock Raiders, they get far, far worse at their jobs. You'll need to be careful not to drill too many walls and discover caverns before you've cleaned up all the job sites in your area, or else the programming really starts to break down. This is a game of patience. You gotta let your Rock Raiders reinforce all the walls and dig up all the pointless rubble and collect all the ore they don't need purely so that they don't get confused when you knock down the next wall. But if you keep your task count low, you only build a few things at a time, and you ensure that your Rock Raiders have collection sites and support stations near where they're digging, you won't have too tough of a time. Oh, uh, until Rock Monsters attack, then, I mean, then you hit the emergency button and all your armed Rock Raiders go into complete chaos mode and follow no semblance of logic whatsoever as they run about shooting off laser beams. There is an upside to all this mess though. It gives the Rock Raiders an odd little quirk that isn't all bad. Look at these little empty-headed himbos. They're so lovable. They feel like children. They're small, they're bad at their jobs, they're not quite sure what's going on, but they're quite happy to be here. And if you don't feed them sandwiches every now and then, they start to get increasingly more incompetent. Their priorities are a mess. They're constantly walking into danger, stepping in lava, and dropping what they're doing in order to get a snack. These idiots are picking up energy crystals with their bare hands. And you're not going to tell me that's not radioactive. You're hollowing out a planet with a workforce of volunteer eight-year-olds. And it's actually kind of amazing. And, like, don't worry about it, because if they take too much damage, they're not going to get hurt. They're just going to teleport up to the ship instead. So you can just giggle at their incompetence, guilt-free. And it is important to be able to do so, because you're in for a bit of a slog if you can't. Let's drill down a little deeper on resources and buildings. This is not math. Rock Raiders is a game about one thing, getting those gorgeous green crystals. To this end, we guide our Rock Raiders to drill through different types of rock and dig through the rubble to find three different resources. The first is ore. Little William hadn't the foggiest idea what the hell ore was, and when I started playing as an adult, I wondered why they didn't just call it iron or something. But then the game made it clear. This is not iron ore, this is Lego ore. You'll build all of your buildings out of ore, but you can also optionally build a smelter. This will let you convert your Lego ore into studs, the second type of resource. Studs are, well, they're optional, and they're also pretty much entirely useless. You can't do anything with them that you couldn't just do with ore. You just get to use them instead of ore when you're making buildings. I basically never found a reason to build a smelter. I mean, you're pretty much drowning in ore by the end of every level anyway. However, I did end up trying it out in Manic Miners, and I am forced to concede that there's probably some small niche for studs and smelters. In theory, if you smelted all of your ore into studs, you could carry them to building sites much faster than regular ore. You're carrying around one stud instead of making four trips for four pieces of ore. On the longest of missions, it's probably worth it, but I'm still skeptical. Then the last resource. The best resource. The star of the game. Energy crystals are just the best, man. Almost every level is about finding truckloads of these little bastards. They're rare, and they're precious, and they're beautiful, and they glow, and I love them so much. I thought it wasn't possible to get any closer to perfection when I was a little kid, and my opinion is basically unchanged as an adult. I mean, there's a reason that energy crystals have continued to be used in multiple different LEGO sets over the years. even after 
after Rock Raiders was discontinued. People like The Rock, man. We like The Rock. Okay, but they actually do do more than just glow and look nice. Energy crystals are a requirement for all of the advanced buildings, and you also need to have a bunch of them stored in your power station to run all those buildings. You're always in a race to get enough of them to build and power a support station, which will filter the air for your level. Then after that, you need to balance the fact that you need to get enough of these things to complete the level. But all of the tools that will help you mine and collect crystals faster also cost energy crystals. This could have been interesting, but was kind of a flawed implementation of that idea. And we'll talk about what went wrong in a second. But for now, we gotta cover all of this stuff that your Rock Raiders are gonna be building with these crystals. Rock Raiders existed to sell toys, so they put a lot of effort into implementing all of the individual buildings and vehicles you could buy. These buildings were all really fantastic to look at. They've got the latest lighting effects of 99 pouring off of them, and even steam bursting out from between the bits of Lego. But the problem is... The priority was not gameplay. The priority was including all of the LEGO sets. There are a lot of buildings and vehicles in Rock Raiders that are basically redundant. In the LEGO sets, it's cool as hell that there are so many different types of drilled vehicles in Scoutcraft. But in-game, there's, there's no fog of war. Why would you need Scoutcraft? And why would you need so many different types of drills when the smallest one does just fine? And when the smallest one isn't enough, you just build the biggest one, the Chrome Crusher. There's basically no reason you'd ever build any of the other digging vehicles. I mean... The laser drills drain energy crystals when you use them. I never built a single one of those things, but I wanted to. I mean, they're cool, but the mechanics punish you for building the cool stuff. The buildings are very similar, where only a few of them were useful. Now, with Rock Raiders being a game of patience more than anything, and with buildings and vehicles requiring you to buy them with the same resource you needed in order to win the levels, it means that you'll usually end up being pretty stingy when it comes to resources. On most maps, the golden strategy will be to build all of your prereqs to create a support station so that you don't run out of air. Then, you'll buy a small cutter to drill through the hard rock that your raiders can't get by hand, and you'll probably grab one or two small transport trucks to zip around the map grabbing crystals and bringing ore to remote build sites. If it's an extra long map, you probably also want to grab a vehicle upgrade station so that you can give your transports extra cargo capacity and upgrade your cutter's drill. More often than not, you're wasting both time and resources by building a large teleporter to get other vehicles, however cool they might be. I don't like this design. The game has a ton of fancy fun buildings and vehicles that you want to play with, but the actual game design is such that you're better off stopping halfway through down the building tree and just playing very lean. Manic Miners couldn't even fix this flaw, since it's such a fundamental part of the game. Listen up, YouTube Raiders, cause now we've reached the tricky part. I'm going to... This is literally the noisiest slug. This is literally the noisiest slimy slug while I'm recording. And if you haven't already, why not take a tunnel scout across the lake so you can subscribe to the channel and then collect 45 energy crystals? Please, my children are starving. Okay, well, I think I can't get away without talking about the presentation any longer. The graphics in particular are kind of a proverbial elephant in the room. This game looked really good, and all contemporary reviews had nothing but good things to say about the graphics. My last video about Descent to Undermountain was an example of a 1998 game using 1992 3D tech. Well, LEGO Rock Raiders was a 1999 game using proper cutting-edge 1999 tech, and it shows. The fact that the LEGO pieces are just flat colors means that the textures don't hold up too badly. Even the cave walls aren't terrible in the modern day. Regardless, it was the lights and particle effects that were the stars of Rock Raider graphics. These things were space age at the time, and my eight-year-old brain could barely comprehend the fidelity I was looking at. Honestly, if an indie team in 2022 were to drop a game that looks exactly like Rock Raiders in the modern day, 
but it was like a little bit higher res and it included anti-aliasing, I don't think people would be complaining too much about the graphics. These are 1999 graphics that hold up okay in 2022. Moving on, let's have a chat about the audio side of things. An energy crystal has been found. When I say the word energy crystal, I am saying it imperfectly because the varied intricacies and nuances of these words exist only in comparison to how the voice actress says it in game. These words are the raw stuff of Plato's realm of forms, spat unblemished into our world. These voice clips come from the very throat of the Logos itself, the closest our mortal selves can ever come to hearing eternity. When I say, Rome could rush it. I say it two steps removed. Chrome Crusher. My brain interprets a flawed version from the original voice work, and then my mouth belches forth an even more imperfect version of my brain's already imperfect interpretation. And when I say rock hard, rock hard. I'm, look, I'm, I'm trying to say I really like the voice work. It's well done, and the clips are spoken in a way where you don't really get tired of hearing them. It's that classic RTS effect where the units say the same things over and over, but in a way that it just gets stuck in your head. Rubble. 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 <coughs> the sound effects too were also a big highlight, and something reviews at the time were complimenting. In terms of music, there kinda wasn't any. There were a couple tracks that would play like between missions and during cutscenes and stuff, but nothing during gameplay. The atmospheric tracks they play are fine, but because levels can drag a bit, I honestly felt like I just needed a bit of a bop to keep me going. And fortunately, although the PC game did not have any bops to offer, there are still some pretty fantastic options. Although the PC game didn't really have a soundtrack, the PS4 game did, so you can always play that in the background. However, I stumbled across a fan channel that created a Rock Raiders soundtrack a few months ago that is so good that I pretty much consider it to be the Rock Raiders soundtrack that we never got in 99. You've already been listening to this music in the background by RR Slugger for most of the video. So I really recommend that if you're interested in this game, you go check out his channel. And I mean, let him know I sent you. Last presentational thing I want to talk about before we move on to the gameplay is the UI. It's relatively clean, I would say, but that's not why I'm bringing it up. See, the UI is notable for having very little in the way of text and presents almost everything you're going to need purely through pictures. Although this can be a bit clumsy, and Manic Miners chose to do away with it entirely, I actually have to give huge props to the original in this case. Remember how I said that mousing over stuff will have voiceovers tell you what you're looking at? Well that, combined with the picture-focused UI, means that kids can play this RTS even if they're not strong readers yet. This is an RTS that a six-year-old could conceivably play if they had enough enthusiasm for it. I legitimately don't know if there are any other RTSs, even in the modern day, that can really claim the same. And if there are, I'm willing to bet that none of them have the mechanical complexity of Rock Raiders. If you have kids, and you want to introduce them to this genre at a young age, let them play Rock Raiders or Manic Miners because it holds up a lot better. But in that case, you might need to help them out with the reading. Speaking of people who need assistance reading, this video is sponsored by my patrons and presumably not for much longer. If you'd like to sign up to be part of the patron credit roll, you can find the link down in the description below. Uh, in seriousness, I, I know that my Patreon's kind of in a weird spot right now. The channel has shifted a lot over the last couple months from like being purely about like tabletop role-playing games to now being more about like video game reviews. And my Patreon perks haven't really updated to go along with that. However, if you'd still like to have access to the written rules and printable game assets for an 800-year-old role-playing game invented in Norman, England, then you'll find all that down in my Patreon below. 
LEGO Rock Raiders was one of those games that stuck with a lot of people over the years. The reviews were not kind to it, with the exception of some praise for the graphics and sound work. The reasons given mostly line up with all the criticism that I've given to Rock Raiders over the course of this video. But the problem is that all those reviews about the quality compared to other games, well, they may have missed the point somewhat. By following my usual format of reviewing the game with some retrospective elements thrown in for spice, well, I may have made the same mistake the contemporary reviews did. Because while Rock Raiders is flawed in so many ways, it kinda doesn't matter. Because the virtue of Rock Raiders isn't that it's a good game, because frankly, it isn't. The virtue is that it is a LEGO RTS game for kids. It was a chance to finally see those little LEGO dudes you own run around the way you always imagined they would. It was a game that spoke to you like you were a kid at a theme park, and the graphics convinced you that you really were at one. The gameplay actually didn't need to be good, it just needed to deliver on the premise, and honestly, it did. This game may not have hit for adults, but for kids, well, I mean, there's a reason that the community for this game is still active for a poorly reviewed 1999 computer game from a forgotten LEGO theme. My game disc functioned for approximately six months before it stopped working due to scratches. And when it broke, I broke. I was devastated. I was sobbing. I was crying. I was literally begging my parents to take me to church so that I could pray for God to fix it for me. And that, uh, that, that didn't end up working. Rock Raiders also manages to be perhaps the best first RTS for kids of all time. It's mostly stress-free and relaxing, but not without difficulty. The devs also took special care to keep the game free of violence. See, even when your Rock Raiders just friggin' laser beam some rock dudes, they don't die, they just split up into little dudes and run away. Which is good, because in every rendition of the Rock Raiders story, rock monsters are non-violent, and they just want to crunch on some crystals. They may cause some damage as they're trying to get those crystals, but it's all incidental. They're not out to actually hurt your Rock Raiders or anything. Had the game been more violent, things might have had some unfortunate connotations. Listen up, you two braiders. This is going to be the hardest mission yet. A group of civilians have gotten too close to our mining operation, and you'll have to carpet bomb their entire village. Make sure you equip your miners with blaster crystals. We absolutely must ensure there are no survivors. Then, to cover our tracks with The Hague, you'll have to plant false evidence that they attacked first. And then... Collect 65 energy crystals. As special as this game was for me, I'm not the guy who's been keeping it alive. The community who deserves all the credit goes back as far as 2008. Rock Raiders United is a forum that started out with one singular goal figure out how to get Rock Raiders working on modern machines. Then, having accomplished that goal, the community started to grow to include the creation of mods and bug fixes for Rock Raiders. Today, I think it's fair to say that they completely smashed their original goal, and now, on their 17th consecutive victory lap, the forum has grown significantly broader, hoping to do the same thing for dozens of other old LEGO games. Now, I'm a touch worried that YouTube will attack me if I drop sketchy downloads links in my description, because, I mean, we try not to fed post on this channel. So if you want to play Rock Raiders or pretty much any other old LEGO game, hit up Rock Raiders United and they'll get you sorted out. But all of the community's continued interest came to a head when Baraclava started creating a Rock Raiders remake in 2019. As I'm sure you can tell by now, I've clearly got some complaints about Rock Raiders, no matter how much I loved it as a kid. Now my intention for this video was not to do a good, honest, objective review, but rather for this to be the most absurdly biased piece of Rock Raiders propaganda that has ever been created, but I... I, I, I couldn't make that. I love this game. I still love this game, but it's got some major design flaws that I, I can't brush over. 
Some of it is just buggy programming, but other flaws are just fundamental to the core design. See, Rock Raiders was apparently extremely rushed and received a ridiculous number of reworks. Literally 30 megabytes of this 80 megabyte game is made up entirely of cut content. If the team had just been given enough time, or if this were a modern game where they could have cleaned it all up with patches, then this probably would have been kind of a flawless 90s RTS. But that's not the game that was launched. I will tell you right now, however, that the fan remake, Manic Miners, fixes all of the bugs, and it irons out most of the problems. Albeit, it couldn't solve everything. It's so obvious how much love and care was put into the remake. Not only does it fix old problems and update the graphics, but all the additions feel like the logical progression to the mechanics in the original. For starters, the programming is clean, so you can multitask way more and drill down every wall you come across without reservation. Plus, all the bugs have been fixed up. The remake is so much less of a slog since your raiders actually know what they're supposed to be doing and they're way more reactive and better behaved. In addition to recreating levels from the original campaign, Manic Miners also includes a map editor and a ton of custom maps made by the community. I'm actually kind of surprised the original didn't have a map editor, it just kind of seems like the kind of game that would. And remember how I said it was strange that Rock Raiders had persistent raiders that would transfer between missions? Well, in Manic Miners you have that as well, but you also get a really robust unit editor, so you can name and customize all your little child laborers. It's so much fun! They've even included the original iconic Rock Raider characters as units you can play with on the map, and they recorded custom voices for those characters. Eight-year-old William would have killed for this. There is one downside to Manic Miners compared to Rock Raiders, though. As I mentioned earlier, the remake does away with the visual-only aspect of the UI. This is better for adults, but worse for young children. I would say that a six-year-old could play Rock Raiders unassisted, but I would not say that about Manic Miners. But regardless, end of the day, Rock Raiders is a fun but incomplete game, and Manic Miners is the fully completed version of it. Go play it. And if you've got kids, have them go play it. Hey everybody, if you made it this far, I assume you're actually my core people. In which case, hey, I'd like to invite you to something. I'm going to review the 2006 Dungeons & Dragons MMO, and I've gathered together a small band of D&D YouTubers to form a guild with me. And all of you are invited to join us. We'll be playing over the entire month of October, and the game is free to play, so there shouldn't be a huge barrier of entry. I'm currently setting up a Discord server for us all, and it will be ready for the public sometime next week. So keep an eye on the community tab for when I announce it, and then you can all pile into the server. I think we're gonna have a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to all of you realizing over the span of a month that I'm just an awkward shitposter. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll be back to D&D and 40k games next time.